you want to leave, uh, leave that open, we will be in uh, Romans chapter 14, and that's kind of our, our theme verse uh, for this morning. I never know where to set this podium. It's like if I put it here, I feel like I'm preaching to my family, and so I might move it over here, and I'm preaching to this side of the church, right here, the good side, right? Good morning. good morning, and it's good uh, to see everybody, uh, especially uh, especially our visitors this morning, and uh, I'll acknowledge them in a little bit, but you know, isn't it a blessing and a answer to prayer that we have all three of our shepherds in attendance this morning? We, we miss when they're not. Our prayers are continually with Bill uh, through his uh, treatment and his journey. <clears throat> also have my mother-in-law um, in uh, the audience this morning. It's good to have her. Um, I also have uh, a, uh, a teacher from the high school when I was a junior in, in high school. Miss Patty Oche is in attendance this morning and we're grateful to have you. Man, what an impact when you know that your, you know, junior English teacher uh, slash senior um, class sponsor uh, still comes to hear you speak. That's, that's great. I appreciate that very much. I don't know if she remembers. Uh, she probably does. <clears throat> she has a pretty good memory. But our, uh, my senior year, I was senior class president. And they were, she and uh, Beverly Arnold were uh, co-sponsors of the senior class and uh, they came to me and it's I don't know I don't remember if it was a week before graduation or a couple weeks before graduation but they came to me and they said the person who's supposed to sing at baccalaureate is not going to graduate can you sing and I said well I've seen in church and they were like okay can you sing God bless the USA and I said, well, I can sing it a cappella. And they, I, I listened to that all the time on my a cappella CD. And so they were like, come on in. And they took me in a room. I don't know if there were any others even trying out. They took me in a room, said, sing it. And I sang it, and they said, you're hired. <laughs> and I, I don't know if there were any others they listened to that day or not. But on baccalaureate, I sang in front of my senior class and everybody else in Owasso, God bless the USA. It's still on video if you want to see it. <clears throat> it's grateful to, uh, to have everybody with us this morning. Um, Romans chapter 14. We're, we're studying Romans in our youth class, and we have one more chapter to go. And it always seems like whatever chapter we're covering, there's always something in it. Something in it for us today that we can take, that we can learn, that we can use. And I am convinced that this, the scriptures would not be here for us today if there was not something we could take from them. And so we're going to spend a little time in chapter 14 this morning. And if I were to give this lesson a title, it would be, it's not about the meat. It's not. And I don't know if you get that from this text or not, but, but I'm certain if you ask, any leader in the Lord's church, whether it be our elders or other elders, and, and you visit with them, I, it, and you ask them, you know, if there was peace, harmony, and unity, would it bring you joy in your congregation? And I don't know if there's a one that would say no to that. Just think about that. They would unanimously agree. And as Hebrews 13, chapter 17 instructs us, let them lead. It's a part of what we play in the congregation under their leadership. Let them lead. Let them be leaders with joy. With joy, not grief. For that would be unprofitable for us if that were the case. It'd be wonderful if everyone in the congregation could agree 
with everyone else. Everyone would live in this uh, perfect state of, of harmony. Just like the 1982 song, Ebony and Ivory, sung by Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder. I have that on there. This, this just shows, I don't know how many of you play piano or musical instruments at all. I know some teach piano, but I'm like, you can't have one without the other. That's where it should sound like. If you want perfect harmony, if you want it to sound great and pleasing to the ear, you got to have it all. You got to have all strings on the guitar. You can't just use one or two. You can take that off now, Jason. Part of that song is we learn to live when we learn to give each other what we need to survive. Ebony and ivory live together in perfect harmony. However, unfortunately, that's not realistic. Paul knew that in his letter to all the churches because he addressed the concerns and he addressed the issues that were happening in their day. Wherever there are human beings, there will be conflicts, there will be contention, there will be disputes, there will be hurt feelings, there will be disagreements. It's not a matter of if, but when. It's true at work. It's true at school. It's true in sports. I remember when I coached boys soccer. And we get out there and the other team would start fighting with each other. And I'd tell the boys, hey, we got them now. They're fighting. They're fighting with each other. They're not going to play well together. It's no different in the Lord's church. We need to remember that it is the Lord's church. Not your church. Not my church. Not our church. It's his church. And if we think, follow, and do with that in mind, we can't but come close to harmony and unity. Paul spends a good amount of time in his letter to the Roman brethren discussing the question of how we should act toward one another when we don't agree with them. Paul was very aware of the conflict that existed in Rome, and, and he already mentioned in the 12th chapter, in verse 18, if it be possible, so much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Do all that you can do to live in peace with everyone, and that includes your brother. We can't be totally certain when we look at the scriptures and these passages here, the church in Rome, of what was going on here, but we know it involved eating meat. Verses 2 and verses 21. It, is, it involves observing special days or, or feasts, verses 5 through 6, and in some way drinking of wine, in verse 21. Just not exactly sure who Paul had in mind when his response was, was to the strong, verse, or chapter 15, verse 1, and then the weak in chapter 14, verse 1. Exactly who was considered the weaker? Was it the Jews? Or the stronger? Was it the Gentiles and some of the Jews, including Paul? We can only assume and the situation here is that some Christians were, were thinking in their mind and had the mindset that, that we are stronger spiritually than you because we do it this way or we think this way. Regardless, there's a message. If Paul were to write a letter to the church that meets in Owasso today, what would he say? What would, if we stood up and we read this letter and everybody's hearing about the church in Owasso, what would we be reading? The 
it's not about the subject matter here of meat or drink or specific days. It's about respect. It's about compassion. It's about care. It's about concern and love and understanding and peace and unity in Christ. And he lays it out in this part of the letter in some 36 verses. Talking about how we get along with each other. In the 14th chapter here, it's also been used sometimes to justify negative actions in the church and the attitudes of brethren. Some have even said, well, this is acceptance, regardless of what uh, one believes doctrinal. We should accept everybody. Or, or maybe to justify some questionable moral practice. We want to do it, so we have the right to look. And some will even say, well, I don't like what you're, you're doing. And if it offends me, well, then according to Paul, then you need to stop. Most importantly, this text deals with how to behave regarding matters of the kingdom and secondary matters, as mentioned in verse 1. These are trivial matters. These are trifle matters. These are incidental. These are non-essential. You have matters of faith and doctrine, and then you also have matters of opinion. Where there is no specific biblical instruction the problem is further complicated when a brother views a matter of opinion as a matter of faith and doctrine. And we've all seen it. We've all seen it in the church. We have experience in your own experiences. You can attest that, that when matters of opinion are present, they divide churches more than matters of faith, doctrine, or biblical authority. Paul provides some principles to give guidance at, at, at times that, that we might find ourselves in disagreement. Whether it is a matter of opinion or faith, these principles can, can be helpful regardless of the situation. It, it can even be helpful not only in the church, but it can be helpful in our friendships, helpful in our marriages and families, fellow employees working together. They can utilize the principles that Paul set forth in Chapter 14. Paul talks about in the first 12 verses here in the 14th chapter that, that we need to respect one another in liberty. The strong respects the weak. There's that theme found, those that verses 7 and 8, which was read. That's our that's our theme. We live for Christ. We live for the Lord. We are the Lord's people. Why would I suggest eating meat when I know full well my brother won't eat it? Can you imagine me inviting someone to my house that I know doesn't eat meat, setting them down at my table, and then coming out in the kitchen with a big old Ham? Why would I why would I do that? Why even go there? Both sides play a part in making this work. Imagine yourself in, in this situation in this time as a Jew who had kept the Sabbath all your life. That's all you knew. You observed all the do's and the don'ts of the Jewish law and their traditions. And then you become a Christian seemingly overnight. And now you find yourself worshiping with fellow Christians on the first day of the week. Would it not be difficult to dismiss decades of Sabbath observance? Would you not think that maybe it was just another day to worship the Lord today? 
Verse 5 says, let us all be convinced fully convinced of the Lord of life. It's about respecting one another in love. And Paul brings out that in verses 13 through 18. Respecting each other in love. The congregational disputes are often petty. Over trivial matters. Over procedures. Well, how should we do this? Over precedent. Have we ever done it this way? Over prestige. Well, who's going to get credit for it? Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not procedure, not precedent, not prestige, not who's who, or trivial matter. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Paul solves this in verse 15. If we just, if we just thought about verse 15, Paul recommends that, that we see our brethren as those for whom Christ died. He died for you, just like he died for me. He died for them, just like he died for me. How about if instead of, of seeing a, a brother as a, a weaker vessel and an obstacle, maybe we see them as an opportunity. An opportunity to, to help the one for whom Christ died. And maybe ask, if, how will what I'm doing or what I'm saying You know, the people out there, outside these walls, the people out there, they, they live for self. Whatever's best for them, whatever suits them. But the people in here, the church, should be concerned about our responsibility to one another and to the Lord. Having compassion for each other without compliment. And Paul mentions in, in verses 19 through 23 about respecting one another in, in peace. Some things make for peace that we do, and some things they, they, they make for hostility in the church. Insisting on having one's own way, it creates strife. It creates division. It creates hostility. While a yielding, serving spirit promotes peace. It promotes care. It promotes concern and love. James 3.17 addresses that. And the, having the wisdom from above is is pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's yielding, it's merciful, and it's good. It's amazing what, what change can take place when one thinks about others before themselves. Not to tear down or destroy is what happened in verse 20. What are they destroying? You're destroying the work of God. The work of God for the sake of food or whatever we want to put in that blank. We're hindering the work of the Lord when we let something trivial matters come before others. And we can fill in that blank with whatever we want. That applies to us. For the sake of our opinion. Considering that we might be actually tearing down the work of the Lord with our words and our actions. And then toward the end of the chapter and even carrying on to the first 13 verses in, in chapter 15, Paul talks about respecting another in unity. 
We have to respect others for unity and harmony to be a part of our lives. He says, be like-minded in verse 5 of chapter 15. And with one mind and one mouth, do what? What do we do with our mind, our, our one mind and our one mouth in unity? What do we do? We glorify God. That's what we do. We glorify our God when we do that. Ephesians 4 verse 3 says, Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Having both peace and unity mentioned there in this verse. In the bond of peace. Peace brings us together. We sing that song, do we believe it? Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Cords that cannot be broken. Do, are there any broken cords out there this morning? Bind us together with love. And if there are any broken cords, why are they broken? What's causing them to be broken? not about the news. It's about us. And how we treat and act toward one another. <clears throat> Turn to the Lord in prayer. In John chapter 21 verses 21 and Jesus appeared to his disciples nearby the Sea of Galilee, and, and he took advantage of this opportunity to talk with Peter regarding his denial of him before his crucifixion. And at the end of that conversation that he has with Peter, Peter asks Jesus about John, <clears throat> which I thought was so interesting. That's so typical. He asked Jesus about John, who's standing nearby, and Peter says, Lord, what about, what about him? What about that man? And Jesus replied, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, but Jesus replies to him, what is it to you, Peter? What is it to you? You. You follow me. Big capital Y O U. Follow me. In other words, stop worrying and concerning yourself about others. And start worrying and concerning yourself about your own relationship with me. Because we all have our hands full. More than we can handle just taking care of our own lives before God. Which takes us back to the 12th verse of chapter 14. So then let each of us be accountable of himself. I will not be speaking on behalf of anyone but me on that day. And you will not be speaking on behalf of me. And if you're wondering today if you are of the age of accountability, whatever that means, or whatever age that is, I use this verse to 
answer that question? If you read this verse and you're uncomfortable, and it makes you uncomfortable, you're at the age of accountability. Where you have to stand before the Lord and give an account for what you've done. And that's age group. That's any age. To be accountable. anything that you need this morning. I know I know they all our elders come down and usually just two of them, one on this side, one on the other. But since all three are here, I'm going to ask that all three of you come down. One in the middle, one on the side, and one on the other. And if there is anyone that needs to respond to the gospel gospel message. Those three elders that care and love and have concern for you will be down here. To pray, to talk, to study, whatever it is you need. They're here for you. So let us always in everything make it a blessing